Juan, you're good. Hey, well, hey, thank you guys for the introduction. Um, I don't know if I volunteer as, as much as Sebastian twisted my arm because I got Sebastian to uh, brief when I had a round table not too far ago. But I'm kind of really happy to be here and happy to talk about what I do, both uh, as a job and as a hobby. So let's start off with the overview. And I, I got to make this statement uh, first and foremost so I don't get fired. The statements I make are my own opinion and do not necessarily represent the views of the Air Force or the Department of Defense. Um, I don't know how legally binding that is, but I do have to say that. Uh, so this is some of the things that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to not talk about me very much because that's not exciting, but I'm going to go into what is Title X gaming. Then I'm going to talk about Futures Game, which we ran distributed and just ended two weeks ago, um, which is kind of why I'm hiding out in my basement. Then I'm going to talk about our Truman game that was planned for Global Engagement 20, which is a competition game. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with hobby gaming and then how the two cross uh, in between. So hopefully you guys will not be asleep by the end um, because that's kind of some of the more fun stuff. All right, so let me t tell you a little bit about me. Um, not going to give away my age, but, uh, you know, I'm not young. But... I've been a gamer since the 1970s. I probably started in junior high school. And I list a couple of the games here that I first cut my teeth on, and I enjoyed it. Um, big reason was that I've always been really interested in history. And gaming is just another way to kind of compete with your friends as you're growing up. Um, growing up in New York City or right outside of New York City, it's all about the competition. So it was like a fun way to spend some time when you couldn't go out outside of the house and, and commit crimes. Um, but then in the mid 80s, uh, I had to go off to college. So I, I kind of took a break from war gaming for a little while. And I kind of wish I didn't, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so what did I do for all that time? Well, as you can see here, I spent a lot of time in all three um, components of the Air Force. I think I have to now as a retiree do uh, civil air patrols. So I can knock them all out. Then in uh, 2015, I became a government civilian and was working with the National Guard. Um, I actually helped stand up, stood up the uh, office that became Space Force. And in 2018, um, I got a phone call and do you want to be a war gamer? And it was one of the best interviews I ever had because my boss said really one question. You really have to love war gaming to want to come here. And um, I, I couldn't lie. Of course, uh, I really wanted to do this. So. As Sebastian said, for those of you that were in the beginning, uh, I became a wolf, which is A5SW, and that's the section that does war gaming. As far as my hobby gaming, and the two will intersect here, and you'll, you'll see this throughout the brief, um, you know, I never really left it. Uh, as PC games started coming out, and if guys remember or gals remember those old Talonsoft games from the 1990s, as they started to come out, I was an avid player. Uh, I went back into board games. And about 12 years ago, went into miniatures. Um, really very interested in the hobby. Um, I was asked to help with some game design. And I really enjoyed that because it's, you know, my, my love of history, as well as figuring out really interesting mechanics of how things work and how games work uh, was something that I was able to do. And as you will see throughout the brief, I've been a writer for the hobby. Um, and a very active proponent of putting an excitement into to the hobby work. And, and as you'll see, I take a lot from the hobby and I put it into um, what I do in my day job. So let's talk about Title X Wargaming. And the first is, you know, you never put a quote on uh, somebody, especially when they're sitting here in the briefing. But I went to what is Title X Wargaming. I took it from Matt Caffrey's book on Wargaming. And the service chiefs have a duty um, by law to organize, train, and equip its forces to meet war fighting needs. And it's different than, you know, um, when, well, when we say war fighting, we're talking about the combatant commanders. They have an urgent need. And if it's something that the Air Force is supposed to organize, train, and equip for, the Air Force is on the hook to develop capabilities to do that. Hopefully, Matt, I did not butcher your. Uh, <laughs> your definition too too much. But what does Title X Wargaming do? 
Well, it really is. It gives, well, it gives the chief of staff a way to look at future systems and as they go through the budgeting process to look at what works, what can integrate better with the force and how best to fight future conflicts. In a way, it's kind of an experiment uh, in the future. Most Title X war games are 20 to 25 years out. The one we just ran was in 2038. And what they take from these games are that if we're trying to build a future force or a force to defeat a, a near peer adversary in 2038, how well did these systems do? Now, we can always get data on how well a system does from modeling and simulation. We understand what the PK of a weapon is. But as I like to say, that's on a sunny day without the enemy getting the vote. What Wargaming does at the Title X level is it takes that MS drive PK and it puts it through a realistic scenario based on a real world conflict that we create within the game and with a ton of other things happening. So if you want to know how well this missile formed, your MS guys are going to tell you 90%. Well, what happens if the enemy cybers us? What happens if we lose space capability? Does this match any of the capability of other services? Are we duplicating things? And that's kind of what a Title X war game does. At the end of the day, it's almost like most other war games, but it's written for the chief of staff, and it's to help them make informed decisions on how best to use the dollars they get from Congress to build that future force. It also gives us a way to prioritize those needs. Um, when the warfighters, the COCOM, send the Air Force, hey, these are the requirements we need for you, we look at systems and we have to have a way to prioritize them. Wargaming is one of the ways in which we do that. Um, the Air Force is not alone in Title X wargaming. All the staffs do it. And I use the term here, analytic agenda. We use the analytic agenda based on the defense planning scenarios and the national military strategy. So when we say near peer, I, you guys don't have to imagine so much that it's China or Russia or a nation like that. But within that framework is all of the scenarios in the future that we would have to um, be up against in, in a war fight. The timeline is also set by that. When do we look at our future force? Obviously today, and I'm not trying to get into a whole thing on budgeting here, but you know, right now we're working on a budget for the next five years. What Wargaming does is it looks well beyond that. It looks 20 years out. So general officers, senior leaders of the Air Force and within the DOD can make a decision to change procurement um, or change to a different type of force in the out years. So that is kind of what Title X Wargaming is. But the biggest thing to take away from this slide is it's for the chief, uh, chief of staff of the Air Force. All right, so let's talk about the, the two big major games that uh, we work and we work with, we run. One is the futures game, and I'm gonna get into that in detail, that we just ran at with the Air Force warfighting integration capability. Um, not gonna go ahead, but it, it, it just finished two weeks ago, and I am just now catching my breath. The other one is global engagement. Um, our section runs that game from end to end, and it's also for a review for the chief of staff. Normally, we run these games every other year, so you'll see terms like FG20, FG21, you know, uh, but usually they used to be run every year or every other year. We ran a futures game last year, and uh, we ran one again this year, and hopefully, well, actually, the one from two weeks ago still didn't end, so I'll get into that later. Um, but those are the two big games that, that we run, we sponsor. We also do a lot of other stuff as subject matter experts. We work with the other services, and I included Space Force for the first time with their Title X wargaming efforts. Uh, we also support joint staff, um, OSD, and others. Uh, I'm putting State Department down because I knew Robert is going to be on, but that is a partner based on my meeting him last year at Connections. So Matt, I'm giving a plug for Connections. 
that we've invited Robert um, to participate in some of our games, and he was instrumental when we get to Truman in helping me flesh that out. And he has invited us to play in some of their games because some of our subject matter experts understand operational art, understand when it comes to the dime, we understand the M. Um, we do not understand some of the others. So I put State Department down here, Robert, and uh, hopefully you're okay with that. We also run tabletop exercises and other studies. Um, following Futures 19, we did a tabletop exercise that looked at particular capabilities. And we also run smaller events, really play tests to look at mechanics or to deep dive on a major issue. One of the things that I hope you take away from this is war games evolve, not the subject matter itself, but kind of how we run them uh, and the, the game mechanics that are used. And that is something that as we go through uh, the rest of this brief that hopefully you guys will take away from. So let's talk uh, about Air Force games in general, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a few questions after this. We run mostly what we call matrix gaming, where we have a blue team, uh, a free play red team, which believe it or not is not done in a lot of places. And we have a white cell that does adjudication and game control. One of the interesting things I think about our games is that we have a retired GO, actually we have two of them, that run the red team, how your opponent would run their military um, in a conflict. I think it really puts the pressure on the blue team to come up with um, unique ways to try to win the war. Because these GOs not only know how red plays, they also know quite a bit about blue. And from the games that I've seen, they really offer a lot of competition for the blue team. They really have to be kind of, you know, their head on a swivel with good situational awareness to beat these guys. As we say, the, the guy that runs our red team, General LeBron, is like 24 and 0 against blue. And uh, you start seeing that competition game aspect right away. Like, we want to beat him in this game which is not why we do the games. Um, one of the things I also want to point out is the role of the white cell. Other than running the administration for the game, the white cell also makes a lot of key decisions in the game. Uh, they oversee everything that goes on. So if the game starts going kind of what we like to call off the rails, white team kind of pulls it back. And you can, you know, I, I can't get into a, any uh, examples, but you guys could see as players really, you know, after sitting there for, for days, working very long days, start coming up with some crazy things like, let's nuke the moon. We, the white cell kind of has to pull them back to reality because the white cell ensures that we stay on the goals of the game. That at the end of the day, we are getting all the data that the senior decision makers need. The other thing that I'm really, intimate with because I've uh, worked on for the last few games is adjudication. And your adjudication are what we like to call neutral subject matter experts um, that will look at what red and blue have turned in for that move and they kind of decide what happens. Somebody said at one time they're kind of like the dungeon master and I'm like no they're more like the dice. Um, they kind of decide what happens and the results. And if you guys are ever involved in a, in a game with an adjudication and something doesn't go right, nine out of 10 times, blame adjudication, and all the people around you will say, yeah. Um, but I can tell you from doing it, it is a long, thankless job. But some of the folks that work in that uh, are some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. And some of them are here um, listening today. So I'm a little bit nervous. As I said, once again, it, it, we run these games out in the future, and our games are anywhere from 250 to 400 people. There's a lot of folks. It's not just the Air Force that's on the blue team. It is the entire Department of Defense. We need the capabilities from every single branch of the military, as well as some outsiders like State Department, um, Paul Mill folks to kind of give the game that, that layer of reality. The Air Force doesn't fight a war by itself, and we understand that. So every single one of our games is joint, and the play of our partners 
is we can't thank them enough to play in our games because they also teach us a little bit of how to integrate some of our capabilities in the future. And just to watch an interaction as a game goes on, I, I think is fantastic. Um, our games usually last one to two weeks, with two weeks being uh, usually how long they take. Now, you think in one to two weeks or two weeks that, well, geez, how many turns do you think they get through? Well, I can tell you not that many, because if you look at everything that goes on in an operational campaign, and we're talking a theater-wide campaign, there's a ton of things going on. So we usually don't look at it as turns as much as hours. And I'll let you guys guess when we open up the Q&A how many hours down the road uh, our games get um, before we have to terminate. How long does it take to prep for these games? Well, I'm putting 18 to 24 months because that's how long they do take. However, as we saw with, the, with Futures game, um, we kind of had to do a quick turnaround on that one once our um, global engagement game was canceled. So before I delve into Futures Games, does anybody have any questions on Title X games? Because I'm sure I missed a ton of stuff. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I, I know we did have one question from uh, Sarah Folks. Sarah, sorry if I mispronounced that. But she just asked, what kinds of uh, M&S support do you rely on? in the games? Well, that's a good question. Um, we don't really rely on it as much as if there is m &S available, we like to use that. Um, a lot of knowing and understanding m &S for the adjudication team is to look at how it was verified, how the data came about. And like I said, a lot of m &S is done on the sunny day, where the environment that we are playing in the game usually is not something the folks that run m and models have thought of. So we try to take that when available as much as a, as a baseline of possible. Um, we try to look at what is similar between how that m and study was done and what's going on in the game at that time. Sometimes it matches up very well, sometimes it doesn't. And usually m and is really focused on one capability area where how well do I know this missile is going to work if the enemy just cybered me or destroyed all my GPS satellites? That's something that m and usually doesn't take into account, but we try to use as much of that as possible when it's available. And hopefully, Sarah, I answered your question. Great. We actually just during that had, uh, Sarah had a follow-up just saying, do you ever draw on campaign modeling? Of course. Um, the Air Force A9 runs plenty of campaign models. Do we use that in adjudication? I would have to say in the, the games I've been involved in, no. But as the blue team spends months planning, a lot of times they rely on those to develop their campaign plan, which is what those models do. And then we adjudicate it based on what's going on in the game. So it's kind of a yes to no. I mean, it's, it's used, um, but it's the problem with some of these uh, models and studies are, we're adjudicating in hours. And sometimes these models can't be adjusted or changed to run the data the way we need it. And we wish that we could get real-time data, but we also understand the constraints of that. Um, plus, some of the models don't take into account for certain things that are going on. So that is why there's a cross between m and and uh, adjudication subject matter expertise. And one thing I'll tell you is we had some folks that bravely risk coming to DC for futures game um, that run a lot of m and suites down at Kirtland. And they were under the impression that, you know, we can automate m and s all this. And their lead guy came to me as he was leaving. He goes, there's just no way we could keep up with this pace. Now, from talking to him, if we can have a database available of case studies, that is great. And that could help us inform these games better. But the pace that these games are run, and with all the moving parts and pieces, some of these models just, just aren't agile enough to do that. Any others? Yes, we have, uh, God, I think three more just uh -oh. sitting uh -oh. there. Yeah. Uh -oh. 
So uh, we had one from Graham Jenkins who had asked um, if you're able to offer feedback on the defense planning scenarios, right? So can you like modify the official analytic agenda to counter unrealistic expectations and wrong assumptions and so forth? So as an action officer, I was loaned to J5 to write those. So I'm going to tell you the DPS is awesome. But yeah, we do, we do adjust them quite a bit. We don't have to stay with it. it it's more like the analytic agenda uh, when that comes down in the national military strategy, that if we do a near peer, like I said, there's two that you would think of. We would more likely do one than the other because of that agenda. But I've reviewed the DPS scenarios and uh, Sometimes we, we, you know, we use them, uh, but we always adjust them. Um, and then uh, one from Robert who had said, um, who captures the, the insights and codifies game experience into future doctrinal reviews? That was, was that Robert Dom, Dominic, Dom, Domain from uh, State Department? I hope not. Um, <laughs> no, that was Robert McCrate, sorry. <laughs> okay, so who does that? Uh, we have a full analysis analysis cell that does that. Um, I wish that we had a way of taking and writing down a lot of what we do in these games. One of the things that I've tried to do with a lot of other folks at work is to try to write rules for our game. And as we go to Truman, you'll see where we did that. Um, but normally, it's something that th these games run at such a pace. Now, he did mention doctrine. Is there a link between us and the doctrine center? Well, we, a lot of the doctrine center helps us adjudicate. Um, matter of fact, our lead adjudicator is a guy that knows doctrine better than anybody else. One of the things we kind of look at is, are you using, you know, a sensible doctrine? Not exactly doctrine as written, because I can tell you what doctrine is today because I can look it up. I don't know what doctrine is going to be 25 years out. So it's kind of a yes or a no. Right, and then we had uh, one more before I think we can move on to the next section. Um, All right. Uh, David Luff had asked, are, are members of the intelligence community invited to join on the, uh, the events? Intelligence, what would we need? Of course, um, we, we ran our entire red team other than a few folks out of NASIC. Um, we rely heavily on our intel to help us with the scenario, the script, and Intel figures very prominently in our games. Um, I believe we've taken SMEs from some of um, a few of the, like NGA we've had SMEs from and NSA. So we rely heavily on the Intel folks because our scenario has to kind of be realistic. So those folks kind of know what the deal is, but we do a lot of research with them and they create the scenario. So of course, yep, yes we do. Okay, and then one more came in and I, I should just say, uh, Dean, I think I'm gonna hold off on that question for now. We'll save that for the end of the presentation, but I'll keep in, keep track of it. And Evan D'Alessandro had asked, um, is it easier to teach someone who had never played in a war game to play in these games because it's a free system or is it more difficult because they get uh, decision paralysis? Oh, that is an amazing question. Um, so, and you could say yes or no, I can't see the chat box, but is it better? Are you trying to say the folks that play in these games often because of years of doctrine and tactical training that they often fail to make a timely decision? If that's what you mean, yeah, often they do. Um, because we're going to put them in a scenario during these games, and it is very stressful. Um, I know, like, well, how can it be stressful? You know, you're in a, an air-conditioned room. No, they're pretty stressful. Um, we put them in a position where they kind of have to look at a solution as opposed to repeating doctrine. And I think that's why 25 years out really helps us out because we don't want to handcuff them to a particular doctrine today. But 25 years out, if there's a better way of doing this, we want them to kind of think about it. Um, but, you know, these games, but folks that weren't subject matter experts, they would be able to muddle through some of these games, maybe with not the great, the best detail, but they would still be able to get through it because it kind of is intuitive. Hopefully I answered your question. And then you seem to have a uh, 
a captive audience because another one or two just came in. <laughs> it's okay. It, it's because I probably misquoted a lot, misstated a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, so uh, Matthew Caffrey had asked if you could just speak a little bit more about the, the uh, SSF Title X Wargaming. Um, you're talking about Space Force and you're talking about the Shriver games. Um, I, I could tell you how they were before they were, before Space Force was a force, but I can't really speak through it now. Um, I know that a lot of folks in my office are heavily involved with it, but Matt, I will try to get you that answer as soon as I find out how they're going to run the next Reaver game. Okay, and I think just for the sake of finishing this, we'll, we'll hold on to any, any questions until uh, either the next section or, or at the end of the presentation. So Mitch, please go ahead. All right, so let's talk about Futures Game 20. We just finished this two weeks ago, and uh, some of the folks that are in this chat are also veterans of that game. Um, Futures Game. Futures Game is an event where we look, once again, 25 years out, and we look at a future force. What will the, the Air Force especially look like in 2038? And how will they use those capabilities to fight the enemy? Hence the name Futures, it's in the future, um, because we don't want him handcuffed to that doctrine. At first, this game, I believe, was supposed to be run uh, towards the end of this year or the beginning of next year, because on the two-year cycle, it should have been Futures 21. However, because of Corona and our reorg, we wanted to get some of that data in, in front of the chief of staff sooner, which I think Corona was last week. Um, so that set the timeline for Futures game. Normally, we run these games at a location. Um, this game, I believe we looked at a place in, in uh, Bossier City uh, to run the game because you're looking at 300 to 400 people showing up for these. But some of us kind of knew in March when the global engagement game was planned that this probably was supposed to be a was going to be a distributed game where we were going to have a small staff run it. Um, out of the Pentagon or nearby and folks that are going to be playing the game would be all over the United States, really kind of all over the world. So we looked at kind of how to do this. Um, but four months ago, maybe a little bit more, it was kind of the decision to, you're going to run this game distributed. Um, we had a lot of challenges We're looking at around 300 players at 15 different locations. And the other thing is I started calling my Wargaming brethren all over the DOD and saying, hey, have you guys ever done this before? And I got a lot of uh, good luck to you. Um, never for a game this big. And tell us how it goes. So this is the tell us how it goes. Um, but it, I think in, and I could speak just for the Air Force, it's really never been attempted this large of a game to do distributed before. One of the things that you would think, because we're running this game with people not being able to converse face-to-face -face or to form planning cells, that we were going to scale back the approach. And let me tell you, that was never a consideration for Futures Game 20. Um, in fact, that we had certain things that we had to make sure that we exercised str strenuously in this game, some capabilities. And I'll get into that in the next slides. But we we kind of had to do that. And these were concepts that even if we were in the same location, were not easy to comprehend as we saw in Futures Game 19. So there was never a scale back approach to this game that we took. So it was a full on game. Um, once again, it's, you know, we didn't really have a kind of a roadmap to go on. And so we went ahead with this. And I could tell you this, and I'm not saying it because a lot of these folks are, are on, but the amount of time and equity, sweat equity, folks put into this game really kind of made the game successful. A lot of people did a lot of work to make this game um, kind of not go off the rails. And I think that a lot more work was put in because of the distributed nature of the game because decisions had to be made and it wasn't like we could quorum at any time to kind of make decisions. So I would say for the hundreds of people that participated in the game, they did an amazing job. All right, so like I said, let's, let's look at some of the challenges for 
before I talk about the game that we had is, you know, believe it or not, you would think the Pentagon has plenty of ample space to run a TSSCI war game. And for the folks that are up here know that that is not the truth. So we decided to, to run the game as secret and formed by TSSCI and beyond, which was now an additional challenge for us because we wanted to make sure thou shalt not um, commit a security violation. And one example is with our adjudication team. We had 38 members in 12 locations. Some of them didn't have access to the TSSEI um, interface, which is JWIX. We had people that were working all the way on the West Coast. We had a whole cell of people at, uh, at Nellis in Las Vegas working on the game. And we had to kind of get over that. Um, a lot of that was just, you know, ensuring that we had enough folks to help us run the game, but it was one of the things that we had to overcome before. Then I, as I got into the lessons or the things that we had to make sure played in this game was two things that, uh, well, one that wasn't played very well in the last game is something called the sensing grid. And one of the takeaways we had from the last game is we needed to find a better way to adjudicate this. And this is a C2 ISR concept, which I'm not gonna go into any great detail. Uh, the other one, too, is the joint all-domain command and control needs to be integrated. So about six months ago, I sat down with folks that were very knowledgeable in this, and we tried to figure a way out how we could play very prominently in the game. And believe it or not, we were able to pull that off. Um, it, once again, was not easy to do, and a lot of people that were way smarter than I was helped me quite a bit with getting those mechanics out. And that's something that, as you know, I talked about, as our games evolve, as we move on, well, how best to now write mechanics or to input mechanics that can look at these two capabilities areas and do it in a distributed fashion. And I, I believe we kind of did pretty well with that. So I'm gonna go with that one. Um, some of the changes we did make are we look at, we're looking at an entire campaign for Futures Day. And it was in the Indo-PACOM AOR, can't say much more. That is one of the biggest theaters of warfare that you can ask for. And if you look at all the capabilities that the Department of Defense has, this was gonna be a massive game as well as it should be. So we looked at, as we went through the games, to look at where the battles that informed how the campaign was going to focus on. Now, that was one of the changes that we put in. However, our players made it pretty easy where the battles were quick, decisive, and bloody, and there weren't too many of them. So we wanted to focus on the battles that are going on in the campaign and focus on those important fights. Um, as much as we talked about that before the game, it seems to be autopilot for some of our players. They just went ahead and did it. So we kind of knew where the battles were going to be as the game was going on. So what are some takeaways I had from the game of what I can talk about? Um, logistics and infrastructure are key for these games. We don't have a war gaming center here. Now, if anybody here has ever been to McCarty Little, I would love a building like that to hold our war games in, or the LeMay Center, or even the, um, uh, facility at Bossier City. We just did not have um, that infrastructure here in the NCR, National Capital Region. I know some of you guys are calling from outside. So we kind of had to look at what capabilities we had. Now normally when we go into these games, we have our own wargaming environment, which is a comm system that's set up where folks can do planning and folks can submit their moves. We were not able to utilize this in the, in the game. So we kind of had to look at logistics and infrastructure. So if anybody here is writing down notes on how to do one of these, you got to get somebody that's not a war gamer, that's not a player to just look at logistics and infrastructure because we just didn't have enough room. Now you look at COVID as well. We couldn't jam 50 people in a room. So we were able to do that um, using um, a lot of tools on the SIPRNet, the classified internet, that we were able to communicate one another. But I, if I, there was anything I wish we could do it over again, I kind of um, wish that we looked at this a little bit more. 
the other thing is the good idea fairing. Yeah, you know, and I'm going to take a hit on this one. Um, we worked with um, some of the other folks to do a move sheet for the game. It would do two things. It would help us collect data and it would help us adjudicate. And essentially it's, it's like a move sheet you would see in any other game with times. And I can even share it with you guys at a later time. The questions that we asked on it weren't classified, but that took longer to do than expected. And I should have made the call to, to kind of almost turn that off before the game because to throw it on the players, I think a, a month before, may not have been the most fair thing to do. Um, now, the data was collected, but the goal was for us to use it in adjudication, and we were unable to do that. So I'll take the hit on that. As far as good idea, fairy, you kind of have to, you have to cut that off uh, well before the game. The other one, too, is the expectation management. Um, everybody goes into these games, especially the players. And when I talk about the blue team, yeah, it's a team, but it's made up of guys that understand nuclear war or global mobility, that understand things that are very specific that they may have been doing in the Air Force for 20 years. Um, a lot of them at this, even late in their careers, haven't seen how the operational art works and how their capability, the one that they're experts on, integrate with some of the other capabilities to create synergistic effects. Um, I would say that expectation management is something too that, that if you're gonna conduct a distributed game, you really need to set that off straight saying, look, is this something that's really key or is this something that's really good to have? And the JADC2 sensing grid was a good example of that. That is something we had to have. Um, but folks in some subject matter areas were like, but we need our stuff in there too. I get you, but tell me what I'm bumping on the other side. Um, one of the things that was success was we set a timeline of when things had to be due. And for the most part, they were, uh, they were, they, we met the timelines of when red and blue had to turn moves in. Um, but the, still the processes took a lot longer. So I believe I was on the phone with somebody that runs games for JSOC. I said, how'd it go? He goes, things take twice as long. Um, yeah, he's pretty much right. Things take a lot longer distributed. And it is because you don't have that instantaneous, all right, let's get into a room and figure this out. And the boss is right there to approve it. Um, so what happens is these folks plan in a vacuum and then it gets approved a little later on. So the processes did take a little bit longer. So how'd the game go? Believe it or not, I felt it was successful. Maybe it was so successful that they want to keep running turns uh, past um, where the game ended two weeks ago. And we're still waiting to hear about that. So when I sent the thank you email to all the adjudicators, I'm like, thank you guys. You guys did an amazing job, but um, your job's not done with you. One of the other things just to point out with these games that other than folks in my section and the Foxes and their briefing in two weeks, that um, this is nobody's full-time job. And, um, you know, I know we have Matt Caffrey on, maybe it's his full-time job, but this is very, very few of the players. This is what they do 24 seven to the air force. So we kind of have to beg, borrow and steal. And as my boss says, it's a coalition of the willing. But it's, it's without those folks, we really couldn't run these games. So I believe we have one more. And then um, this is more of a talking slide or a thing slide for you that it could be do it could be done. It's not easy to do. And look, in the near future, this may be how we have to run games. Um, I'll give you my two cents here. I think if we can figure a way out to perfect the model, perfect the mechanics, and perfect the um, communications. That this may be something that may be preferable in the future. Uh, I know that's heresy, but I look at what makes the, a game good, and it's when you have the best subject matter experts available. And sometimes you won't get them for two weeks at a tough assignment like Hawaii. You know, Who wants to go to Hawaii for two weeks in the middle of winter? Um, but 
if you can't get the subject matter experts to create a distributed game on a timeline that you can get these folks to play, I, I think is a good way to go. And maybe not for a major game, but maybe for a, um, a smaller t TTX type of game. I think there's a future for distributed games after COVID ends. So, yeah, I, I know that, you know, well, I just, just said how hard it is, and it is hard, but I, I think once we work the, uh, the bugs out, I think we'll be able to um, use this model and run uh, distributed games probably at a, at a smaller level. At least I'm hoping to. Um, and then everything in tips is, in case you're here, I know I told some people like, hey, tell me how it went. I really, really want to have a distributed game when I go, hey, come to this brief and you'll, you can hear it. So those are some tips for them. And I'll, I'll take some questions now. You guys do understand I can't go into any great detail about the game. This is more of the mechanics and how it's run. So, do we, Grant, we have any questions? Oh, yeah. No, no worries. Oh, we, good God. <laughs> um, so, uh, we had one from Robert McCrate who uh, asked, will Futures Games wrestle with the interactive dynamics of mist a uh, sorry, mixed AI uh, and neuro neuro well, neurobiological disruptive systems. In effect, will they be out-of-body avatar-linked conflicts where all combating parties possess equivalent technologies? Oh, how can I answer that without going to jail? I'm going to say yes, because that's all I can really say here. But yes, you're looking at how few warfare is going to be done in the future. And I would say it's a big paradigm shift in certain cases of what we're doing now. And that's probably all I could talk about here without uh, one of these fine people I work with turning me in. Great, okay. Uh, very secretive answer, I kind of like that. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we had a follow-up from, from Graham Jenkins. Um, uh, and he said, you may have touched on this, but um, I assume STO capabilities don't come up, don't come up much in this series. Yes, they do. Um, I skirted by it very delicately when I said top secret and higher. But yes, yes, they do quite a bit. Uh, Once then, again, very, very tough to answer that question. <laughs> uh, and then one from David Luff who asked, uh, how has commercial wargaming influenced you on running these events? Well, uh, and separately, have you ever had a have you ever test run a scenario at a wargaming convention? First, Dave Luff is a guy that I wargame with now, and um, um, I wish I could run some of the scenarios with some of the wargamers I know that I hobby game with, because they're no kidding experts. And Dave, I'm going to get to that in depth at the end. Um, but how much do I take from the hobby gaming community? Once again, I'm going to say, that's like the whole back half of my briefing, but a lot, um, because that's where all the great new ideas are coming from. So there's, I love reading um, game rules manuals. I have a whole shelf of them somewhere around here. I have a lot of books. Um, I look at that of how I can use them for these type of games, but I'll get into that deeper later. I promise Dave. Got it. All right, we have uh, two more for now. Uh, so Sarah Folks had asked, are there any specific technologies that really shined in past Title 10 more games that we see today? Once again, these are such tough questions to ask, uh, answer. Um, yes, um, I would say when it came to the JADC2 concept and the sensing grid concept, which I, I can't get into any detail with, that. I'll give you an example with Sensing Grid that it came up in last year's game and nobody understood it. And we're talking a couple of hundred people, maybe two people understood it. Um, however, it was something that we played in this year's game. And because we were able to gamify it much better, folks really kind of understood how that future capability would work. Now, with that being said, and just to be honest, did the light bulbs turn on for all the folks that were in this game as far as those capabilities are concerned? And no, because they're very difficult to kind of get your, wrap your head around, for lack of a better term. But what scared me a couple of months ago with our expert on that, when she said, yes, you, see, you know what you're talking about, 
and I had no idea what I was talking about. Um, some of these are very, very hard to understand capabilities that we need to get better at uh, the fight in the future because our enemies, um, you know, we don't want to open a window of vulnerability. So hopefully I answered that question once again without, without committing a National Security Act violation. Uh, and then we had one from Evan D'Alessandro who had asked with everything having shifted online, um, what are the issues, if any, in, in keeping adjudicators and players in sync with one another? Oh, good God. Well, I, I can't answer that question because I don't feel I did that, but there's somebody that's on this uh, uh, brief right now, Becky Gorman, and she was the, what we call the, uh, the train conductor for this, um, that she kept our, our schedule. Um, a lot of it is just pushing, shoving, and saying, you guys have to have this in by now. It's kind of like, like uh, this, when you see the stock market, with everybody screaming and yelling. Sometimes war games get like that, um, but it took a lot of ensuring that all the teams were on the plan. And that is what White Cell does, is, hey, this, we need to have your turn submitted by this time. And they keep both teams to that plan. Uh, it is probably one of the hardest things to do in a war game, even if we were all in one place. Uh, it is like herding cats, cats that don't listen. So, um, all right. I think for now, and feel free to for go now. that. We uh, we got to say some for later. Yes. So so yeah. So feel free to go ahead. Uh, and if I accidentally skipped over your question, badger me in the chat, and um, we'll get it at the next break. All right, so here's a game. Uh, let's switch gears now. Here's a game that, that wasn't, and one I really like to talk about, and it's called Global Engagement 20. Global Engagement is one that we run and we design end to end. Um, let's go about, Global Engagement's been run almost every two years in the past, but let's go to kind of why this Global Engagement was different. Um, Deputy Secretary of Defense said, you know, we run a lot of these war games, but let's run a competition game. Um, well, what is that? It's really what great powers do prior to a conflict of how do we set the theater? How do we set the battle space? How do we in interact with allies and partners? It's no big government secret that, you know, we've, we can't win wars without allies. Um, how well do we interact? How, how well can we perform with them? And a lot of it, you know, you don't get in a war game. That's the operational end. But global engagement was supposed to be this, this competition game where we looked at all these things. And how do we shape a theater um, against a near peer with our Five Eyes partners? So that's how we decided to run global engagement. It was a war game without war. Um, so how do we go about designing that? Some of the folks that, that that worked on designing that are here in the room. So I'll try to give them all the shout out. But when I look at what is a competition game, I'm an old gamer. Oh, I'm old and I'm a gamer. Um, but Twilight Struggle was a good template. So I brought that in and I showed my boss Twilight Struggle because this is kind of, and I'm sure most of you, if you haven't played that game and you're on this group, please go out and buy it. It is an amazing game. Um, and I, I don't get a cut of the profit because, you know, it's, I'm just a fan. Um, but that was a good template on if you know anything about Twilight Struggle, the object of the game is not going to war. And it's between, you know, the East and West block. And if you go to war in Twilight Struggle, you lose. So that was kind of a good template. We were lucky where our Plan Blue game is the one we won with Rand uh, was coming up. So we pulled those guys in the office and, you know, here I am an idiot showing their, their lead war gamer, Twilight Struggles, and he has, he's never seen it. And he laughed at me. Of course he's seen it. But we kind of want a, a competition game based on this theater using some of the mechanics that you would see in Twilight Struggle, where you have the different types of influence at play. And, um, of course, if you go to war, the whole thing's over with. So they wrote it as a, as a competition game. They did base it uh, on Twilight Struggle. However, the kind of detail that we needed to go into with the game was something that we were unable to do. Let me just go real quick of what Plan Blue is. Plan Blue is another game we run, and I should have mentioned it earlier, with Rand. It is 20 
general officers, usually one stars. Uh, those are the players that play both red and blue. Uh, usually each team is headed by a two star. Um, and they play the game. They're the AOs for the game. Um, one of the things that we saw, and this is a personal comment, is the GOs, and I've known some of these GOs for years, they understood all the terms when it comes to competition, but how that flows into actually moving influence within the theater was something that mechanically they they really were not experts on. And of course, they shouldn't be experts on it. Um, that we wanted to go into more depth, especially with the, the M of dime, uh, the, you know, in how to use uh, uh, instruments of national power. So we decided to take what Twilight Struggle had, uh, Rand's good model, and we created Truman. Um, Truman was uh, named by Phil Bulger. Once again, he's speaking in two weeks named after Harry Truman, but we spelled it differently because it's the Air Force. We have to have an acronym for everything. So it's the Theater Reactive Environment War Game for Military Analysis. I just couldn't think of anything else, uh, any different ways of spelling Truman that kind of made it, you know, sing like that too, but it's more like, you know, and the first thing that higher ups, when they see uh, the plan for Truman, the first thing is you got to get rid of the name. So. That's why this is my opinion and not those of the DOD, the Air Force. So we kind of had the focus of uh, global engagement, of being below armed conflict. And there were some other things that we're going to be working within the game. First of all, we're going to be doing this game with our five ice partners, which uh, are Canada, England, New Zealand, uh, Australia. And I'm always leaving one out. Wait, I think we're the fifth, right? Yeah. Yep. New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Britain. Um, how do we all work together to posture the theater? Uh, one of the things we also wanted to get out is how does an Australia, New Zealand look to posture a particular theater? Um, and we wrote that into the mechanics and I'll get into that. So we decided to, to go through, we felt that we were able to do a competition game. And we also wanted to use a whole of government approach. So, I lean heavily on Robert, who's on here too, uh, just for some of the, for the mechanics, the things that I didn't know very much about. Um, diplomatic, economics, informational. I'm not an expert in any of those things. I wouldn't even say I'm an expert on, on military, but the M, the military was supposed to be the thing that we were focused on, but we knew that these things don't operate in a vacuum. So we really needed the mechanics to put in the game of how these other things work. So what we did was we looked at, and this is something that we took from both Twilight Struggle and from um, Rand's game, is that we looked at influence and, well, we looked at tilt and influence as tilt and tractability within the theater. So let me just go in a little bit about how the game was played. Well, if it were, were to be played, the game was uh, three turns, each lasting five years. Um, and the goal of the game is at the end, that is your starting point for a potential conflict. So when the game ends, are you in a better position than your opponent for a conflict against them? And we had more detailed um, goals for the game, but we can't discuss them here. We also wanted to use, this, use it as a starting stat of 5G20 because we used the same analytic agenda, it was the same theater. What we had, the, the, the core of the game was to have the nations really do a map exercise uh, that was resource constrained, where they focused on particular nations and they used certain types of um, programs. And here I listed Paul Mill, infrastructure, mill to mill, coercion and counter influence of actual programs that we use in these, sub in these areas to move a country closer to your uh, your side, as it were. So let me give an example. There's a you know country X in the middle of somewhere. Uh, you need to use their bases to be in a better position for this war. But you know they may be friendly to you, but eh, they're not that tractable. It's very hard to get them to come over to your side. What programs? What things would they be interested in 
for you to move that needle where you can ask the question, I'd like to use your country for basing or overflight or to, to store war reserve material. So the folks in this game had a whole theater and I think we limited down to 25 nations played and it could have been up to 43. And we asked them to, where are you gonna put your focus? And you can see here off to the right, this is taken from the cheat sheet for this game. Oh, and by the way, if anybody's interested in playing this game, Sebastian has a copy and uh, you can email me after and I, I'll send it to you as well, the unclassified version. But it is, just think of it as Twilight Struggle with steroids. So instead of putting influence markers like you would in Twilight Struggle, here you had to put really focused programs and these are the pictures of the actual chips to get to influence a country. How would we adjudicate that? Well, if a country needed, you know, you to install comm infrastructure and you didn't say, hey, I'm gonna buy you guys comm infrastructure, well, that country's just not gonna be that interested. So we had folks really playing the, uh, as we call the green team, uh, as those countries to say whether or not, you know, this is a good offer. And don't forget the other side's also trying to do counter influence. And then you have coercion um, that's also going on in the theater. So it was a very busy game, but I think we broke it down uh, in its final iteration to things that, that the players can really get their heads around. So I discussed the tilt and tractability, everything was mentioned towards the national goals. Um, you know, kind of went through all of, all of this before, but I felt that we ran this game a bunch of times and <coughs> folks really kind of uh, started picking it up. And this is, uh, they say, hey, this is actually fun too. And I'll get into that later. But I knew when uh, Dave Ockmanic said, this is a good game, that uh, we had a hit, that this was a good way to war game this for the Air Force. So let's talk about some of the mechanics that we built. Um, a lot of it was gonna be subjective adjudication, but we did wanna have not really tools because nobody builds tools for these type of things, but we did wanna have some tools and there's a graphic below of an example of one of the, of the tools of how tilt and tractability can move. Um, that we wanted to use. We didn't want to make it totally subjective. We wanted to put some mathematical rigor within the game. So people didn't say, well, you guys are just making it up. Um, where the, the level of tilt and tractability each nation had meant something. And then to look at the national goals of these nations, folks really had to study to see what would nation X and Y, uh, what would tilt them towards your side if they were intractable. Um, or do you coerce them? So we really had people do the homework. And we had some really, really awesome folks that were working on that aspect of the game. There's two other aspects of the game to get into that it was part of the game, but can't go into great detail here is one is um, what was our, at the end of the game, what was our lay down in the theater like? And how that interacted with our overall strategic plan. And I'll give you an example. If you have short range fighters and you have to base them close to your opponent, that should inform your strategy in the theater to tilt those nations towards your side. So we wanted to see if that mechanic between those two cells worked <coughs> as they should in real life. So that was one of the things. And then the other thing is what is my future force construct like? And how is that informing where I need to base and then how is how I base informing what nations I need to, uh, you know, uh, tilt towards my side. It's a lot easier to see than for me to explain it. One of the other things too, and, and uh, Phil Bolger invented this, is uh, Strange Love Scale. And if I have to tell you what movie that's from, I'm not. Um, but going to war was bad in this game. Now, the nations, the sides, as they were playing, they didn't know if they were crossing any of the red lines. But, you know, we kind of wanted them to have a free hand in planning as they went forward. And for us to turn around and say, well, that would have started war. We wanted to have a, a measure of mathematically, yeah, that probably was going to start war. So we, we invented 
or Phil invented the strange love scale, which once again, first thing that senior officers say is take that name off. Um, one of the most interesting things about this game was the plenary session. So as both teams went and planned where they were going to focus and what programs they were going to lay down, who they were going to coerce, where they were going to counter influence, that as this was briefed, you would have a session with, with senior level military officers and senior civilians of each of the Five Eyes nations to then adjust that plan. Um, because they start seeing what Red's doing, because Red's their briefing too. And that interaction was, well, why did we have that first of all? Well, because it's fun. Two, it's because it forced these senior folks from all these nations to kind of talk about what their strategy was. And we could take a lot from that conversation as they discussed how to go forward. And that was how we were going to get a lot of analysis. Obviously, some of the Five Eyes nations have different thoughts um, than some of the others, because we're all different nations. Just because we speak the same language doesn't mean we have the, the same strategy. And that interaction was kind of a, uh, well, maybe I should kind of say it, it's kind of like putting them in a zoo cage or terrarium and just watching how that worked. And they didn't understand that they were part of the experiment as they were doing that. Um, I thought that was interesting. But... It was canceled uh, three days before <coughs> we were supposed to head to Hawaii. It was, uh, sorry, two days before it was canceled because of COVID-19. However, we did play test it four times. Um, I felt that when Dave Ogmanic said, this is a good game, that uh, I took that as I did a happy dance inside because his opinion means a lot. But the feedback I got was it was informative and it was also fun. Like that's something that, these games sometimes are, are fun, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so we never got to run the full 15 year game and it's too bad because I would have loved Hawaii. We did run, uh, the Wolves did run a smaller distributed TTX to set the battle space for Futures, Futures Game 20. And that went off and they used some of the same mechanics, but you know, overall, I would still love to run this game in full, and, and it looks like we may get to do that next year. Um, because we wrote it, and I work for the government, I gave it to whoever asked for it. So uh, if anybody wants it, you have my contact information, I will send it to you. But Sebastian also has a copy, and I'm going to try to twist his arm to, to get his class to play that game, because I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and that was one of the takeaways. And now this goes back to Dave Love's question is hobby games really informed how this game was played. Um, one of the things, one of the people I had read these rules was Vocal Runkey, who has done a ton of coin games. And I'm looking over at the bookcase of all the uh, coin games that he's developed. Um, I looked at his games as, is there a better way to do this? And then a lot of the map exercise, I took from some of his games. Uh, I told him about it, so it's not stealing. But I would say that this game was really informed by hobby war games because there's a ton of them out there that cover competition. They don't call it that, but there are a ton of games that cover this subject that I felt did a really good job. And I wanted to make sure that we took some really great ideas into this game. So my big takeaway is, look, don't be scared of new ideas and methods because nothing's ever going to change by doing what we did last year, which is a theme that I'm, I'll hit a little bit more. So I believe we're at another intersection. So hopefully we have some questions. No, that's a, we definitely have questions. So uh, All right. uh, one of the most recent ones was looking back at the chart you had on the last slide was how do you quantify what different nations' preferences might be, right? So a lot of the numbers could be kind of subjective in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how much of them is, is like a reflection of opinion versus anchored in something more, more empirical? Well, there's one thing that the DOD has. It's a lot of experts and stuff like this. And we took a lot of documents and studies that were done. So that stated country X's strategic goal, strategic vision is this. And this is how they tilt towards the United States. 
or towards the blue team? Um, are they tractable or intractable? Some countries just, they don't want to deal with you. We, it was heavily informed by palm mill experts. And I'm going to put Robert once again on the spot. Um, I had him look at it as well. I want the state department to say whether or not this is realistic or not. Now, did we match it hundred percent? No. And I'll tell you why, because it is a game and there's certain things we want to see in the game. Um, we kind of wanted to change it up a little because I didn't want folks coming in there saying, oh, wait, this is my theater. Here, here's my theater engagement plan. We're going to run this. So we changed it up a little bit, but not that much. But it was, we didn't just make it up. We went to the experts. And that's one of the things that we do do in wargaming is I try not to make anything up other than mechanics. And as I just told you a minute ago, I steal a lot of those. Um, that I try to find the experts in this to make sure it's realistic. Because the first thing any gamer, hobby or professional, will turn them off about a game is the sky is blue, you know, or the sky is green. No, it's not green. So this game sucks. So I know that from being a, a hobby gamer, you have to make it realistic. So, yes, heavily informed. And then we had a, a question from Graham Jenkins. Um, and... Uh, maybe you kind of touched on this, but it was, uh, did you model um, influence and in information operations, deception, you know, sentiment analysis, et cetera, and, and if so, how? So we did. Um, going back to some of the focus areas, and if you get a copy of the rules, it, it goes into, on the, on the unclassed version, it goes into examples of what you can do for information ops. But yes, information ops played heavily, um, especially with things like coercion. And I use an example that I, I was told to take out of the, um, uh, the unclassified rules because it was a touchy subject and uh, I didn't. It's still in there, I think. But as you could see going through these, information operation plays heavily and some nations are a little bit more susceptible to information operations than others. Um, you know, once again, can't go into any great detail, but yeah, I would say IO played quite heavily. And if there was something I can go back and do, well, we never did the game anyway, but in planning was to get some real heavy hitters with IO operations um, to develop an IO game plan that was very robust because Sometimes information operations, it's cheap, but very effective. And this game was resource constrained. As you can see by the green chips, you couldn't do everything everywhere. And we costed everything out. So doing an influence operation should have been the first thing a lot of uh, players thought of. So it played heavily in the game. Great, and then I think we've got just one more, um, also from Sarah Folks would uh, just ask if you could give a little more insight on um, some of the general's difficulties and if you thought it reflected uh, that the military either doesn't do or doesn't do well maybe grand strategy uh, in the U.S. system. Yeah, um, these are GOs. They do outrank me by quite a bit, and some of them are my friends. Now, how do I put this out? There's a scene from uh, the movie Men in Black when they're testing out all these folks um, to become one of the men in black and uh, you know, Rip Torn says, thank you gentlemen very much. Your services are not needed. You guys are definitely the products of 20 years of government training. Uh, that is kind of one of the problems that we have um, in it, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but the environment of a war game, we put these folks in very uncomfortable situations, it's things that may be out of their subject matter expertise we challenge them um, and a lot of it is the interaction and the leadership that you have in the room i can give a point from seeing plan blue run a few times that when you have a strong leader in one room that decision oodle loop is very small uh, they make it very quickly but these folks are in there playing the game they don't want to lose the game uh, they want to do well and they also want to make the experiment work um, so they kind of overthink it in some cases. And I think when it comes to some of the things that are taught in senior service schools or at the JFK school, 
that, you know, we explain kind of how they work, but we don't actually send our GOs, even when they're younger officers, to go work in US, USAID or some of these other programs. So they, they kind of identified all the programs, but how you would sequence them and how they would work was something that they would have no expertise in. I think they understood strategy. It was the execution of that strategy and then the timeline of how, how long that would take to do. And, you know, I'm pointing at Robert again here. It's something that when he sat in the room informing the GOs, he was instrumental for because he was like, hey, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, this takes some time. You need to do this first. So they kind of knew the questions to ask, but not how to execute them because it's something they wouldn't do. Because we wouldn't ask somebody in the State Department to execute a, a no plan. So hopefully that answers your question, Sarah. Great. And I think the chat is dormant for now. So uh, I put him to sleep. <laughs> I think you're, you're, you're free to go. Uh oh. All right. So let's talk a little bit about hobby gaming. And I think uh, this goes into um, hobby gaming, it's a multi billion dollar a year business. Um, there are millions of hobby gamers out there of all kinds historical, sci fi, fantasy. One of the things that, you know, if it doesn't exist, somebody's working on a game that kind of puts it out there on the market. And it, it is market-based. It's not based on an analytic agenda. It's kind of based on what people are, being, are interested in. Um, I think that the innovation for mechanics and rules and games are coming from the hobby gaming community, I would say, at a faster pace than from within our own community. And I know that may be, you know, heresy. How can I say that? But I think, and I'm going to get into this in the next slide or two, we have a lot to learn from that community. Because I think we invested in a model in the 70s and 80s of how a war game should be and what it should do. And we threw a lot of crazy math in there. And I think it scared a lot of people away from war gaming. And as you could see from the Truman game, and if I could go into greater detail for some of the things with the um, um, futures game, the, the new ideas that I am putting into our games and some of the other folks are coming from things that are working out in the hobby world, that they have a profit motive to get these mechanics right. You know, if I brief a, a starting status to a bunch of military war gamers, they're ordered to be there and they got to make it work. But I would say in the hobby world, the profit motive and making a successful game really motivates them to think of mechanics and means of display that we need to learn from. When I say we, I'm talking about DOD gaming. I think there's so much to take from that community and that's where all the new ideas are coming from. A little bit more about hobby gaming. It didn't take a hit during COVID. Um, it was still going strong. Online gaming flourished, and believe it or not, sales increased uh, during it. So let me give you a quick one too, hobby versus professional. Um, there are some hobby games that the DoD uses. They use adapted versions of, um, Sebastian and I were talking about Assassin's Maze, which I had a lot of fun playing, uh, it's run on Vassal. And you can see they're taking some things from the hobby world into there. Um, some service schools use games to teach. Sebastian was telling me about that he went up and played with all the midshipmen uh, this past weekend. <clears throat> but one of the things that hobby wargaming can do is building a wargaming culture within the DOT. I am a rarity um, where there's some guys I work with that play games for a hobby, but most don't. I've been, when we used to actually show up in an office, I would bring games in on a Friday and, hey, let me teach you guys this game. But what they didn't know is there was lessons behind mechanics and then asking them questions. So I had some real fighter pilots play a dogfight game. And I asked them questions about game mechanics because they're experts. And now you've just played this. Does this represent mechanics well? You know, how can the mechanics be adjusted for more realistic? And it's trying to, to kind of get them in the mindset of gaming and what gaming is and then all the good ideas out there. Um, 
you know, when you go across, like I said, there's not, there's not a lot of guys that do both. Um, I'm, there's others besides me. One of them is here online now. But for the most part, they seem to be very distant cousins. And I, I think that hurts us as opposed to helps us. And that's why events like Matt Caffrey's Connections are right on, because you get folks from the market talking to military folks and saying, look, I, I've solved some of your biggest problems on how to display this type of war <laughs> or our kind of mechanics behind how to represent this, this, and this. I think that's where the new ideas are really coming from. Um, you know, and one of the things that I've tried to do is to try to get some of my coworkers to play these games. Um, it's because I'm passionate about it and, you know, believe it or not, it helps you uh, in, in, in trying to develop games for the DOD. Uh, I think it does. One of the things that, you know, I've talked to both Phil and Sebastian about is, you know, where's the next generation of gamers coming from? And you may not see it here, but this is a, more of a white beard. I'll tell you this, it's not coming from me. Because in five to six years, uh, well, I'll either be dead or retired again. So some of these younger gamers that really aren't, um, I'd say, that don't suffer from the 20 years of government training, really, those are the folks we need to look at for the future. Because I think they're going to they're gonna be more innovative. They're going to say, well, why can't we? as opposed to a lot of uniform folks or folks like me that say, we've always done it like this, why bother changing it? Um, you know, I'm not the guy to lead that change. And that's why I look at, you know, Goose and this being taught in academia to students as an amazing thing because that's what the next generation is gonna be like. You know, eventually the dinosaurs like myself will all die out and we kind of need to look at new ways of gaming. Now you would figure, with 28 years of detail, whenever Harpoon came out, some people might know that game, like of games like that out, why aren't we using a system like that for our war games? That's a good question. Um, I think that, you know, the new ideas that are coming from folks from outside of the DOD is something that I'm interested in. And whenever I hear one of them speak about, hey, this is kind of what I, think or feel, I always listen because, you know, they're not uh, indoctrinated like I am. And there are some really amazing ideas from these folks, and we just don't listen to them enough. So I really think that that's where the next generation has to come from. So that's why things like speaking here today is amazing, because it gets these good ideas flowing in, into us solving really hard problems. So enough of that. All right, so before I go into, I'm just going to go quickly of, in hobby gaming, these are some of the projects I've worked on. Um, believe it or not, um, everything here, as far as writing or understanding the hobby, I've taken almost everything here into uh, my day job. Because mechanics are mechanics, and means of presentation are means of presentation. Whether or not it's little army guys running around a field, or you know, a large theater level game in 2038, that there's a human interaction. There are mechanics that keep you in the game. Um, there are things that don't work within a war game, a major war game. And where do I play around with that? I am not gonna waste people's time for two years trying to mechanic in a Title 10 war game when I can go and work on one of these projects and, and see if it, if it breaks there. I'm able to play test ideas here more than I am at work and that's just because of the time. Um, and then before we go to the end, here's, here's what I've done. Um, there's a lot of others that are listening today. For the hobby, I run a website that looks at the entire wargaming hobby that tries to build excitement and tries to get uh, the message out there about what wargaming is. There are a lot of folks that ask me all the time about how do I become a professional war gamer? And I'm like, I really wish there was a, a, a plan for that. And that's why things like GWS is, sorry, GUWS is, is 
very interesting to me because that's that's how we can get you know folks into this profession um but matt caffrey has been on one of my podcasts and a lot of other people and matter of fact uh, sebastian talked all about you guys uh at the hmgs roundtable in july and we're going to have him back uh in, in a couple of weeks to speak again but one of the things that we do is we or i do within the, this framework is to look at the hobby to look at trends to look at where things are going mechanics wise what is doable and i've used a lot of folks i've met doing this hobby role um, when developing games for the air force i think that this is just awesome um way to find out good ideas so uh, i think i've hit this quite a bit but why did i throw the hobby gaming stuff in at the end is because you know there's a lot of books in my bookshelves here and people go, what book should I read to learn about war gaming? And you got the Perla book, you got Matt's book and I, Matt, I love your book. Um, but that, that teaches you about war gaming as an enterprise. Uh, it teaches you about what it does and what it needs to do. But one of the things that I'm more intimate with as far as what I do is how to write a game, how to write mechanics, to make um, you know Title Ten gaming better, and I'm learning more from this community than I am learning from some of the uh, you know long um, you know uh, kind of put on a pedestal uh, books and tomes and lectures from the professional war gaming community, and it's not derisive towards them. It is more of looking for where the good ideas are coming from. And, and what's a better place to test out some ideas? So this gets to Dave's question. Would I, have I ever tested some of the things I've done in war games um, that he might have played in? And uh, I'll answer the question finally. Yeah, yeah, there, there are. Um, there were things that I needed to know how they played within a game and whether or not the players who understand the rules were able to grasp them. And I ran at in a tournament a few years ago because I wanted to see how nukes and, and weapons of mass destruction worked in an average war game. I wanted to see players' reactions. I wanted to see what happened. Once again, they were in, in the zoo and I was observing them. And I know it's horrible to say they're my friends, but I wanted to see how those things worked. And you know, one thing about war gamers, they'll tell you their opinion whether you want it or not. Um, I was able to, to see how that worked. And I looked at, there's, there's a better way of presenting this. And so I was able to take that um, from that experience and then put it into other games. So yeah, um, I think that, you know, hobby gaming is most certainly a, uh, a thing that war gamers should look into. Um, yeah, if you ever go to a war gaming event, you know, not a lot of good hygiene going on there. <laughs> Um, a lot of people that haven't left parents' basement in a long time, and I get that. But, you know, they think about wargaming 24-7. They think about better ways to create a game um, all the time. And they come up with some of the best ideas I've ever seen. And I wish there was a way to kind of, you know, sap all that, that brain power and put that more into our games. Because that's something I've tried to do for the last two years and will continue to do until I hang it up. So. I know everybody's going to say, thank God, that's the last slide. Um, but I'm going to open up for questions. We've got, uh, we got a half hour. Well, this went fast. No, well, thank you, Mitch. This was, this was great. And uh, I suppose you've probably been seeing there's a pretty lively discussion happening um, between participants in the chat, which is. Great. I have not seen the chat whatsoever. <laughs> um, so I know one outstanding question we had uh, from Graham Jenkins was, uh, have you ever figured out a way to incorporate miniature wargaming professionally? Sebastian and I were talking about that earlier. Um, I'll tell you why I like miniature wargaming. And, and um, if you look at the Truman game, the map that we were using, I believe was 12 feet by eight feet. And we actually had the players use chips on the map. Like, you know, you saw those pictures here. These were all, we actually had poker chips made uh, with the Wolves logo on one side and this on the other, because there's a tactile 
tactile feel of planning and playing with miniatures that I think works well, and especially for discussion. So when you look at the plenary session, we wanted them not to sit around and talk as an academic exercise. We wanted something them for them to focus on. And then when you see a stack of chips on one nation and you want to move it to another, that it's a point of discussion. I think as a means of display, I think miniatures has a, a role within um, military wargaming. Now, obviously we weren't putting ships and planes out on the board here, but there's something about that means of gaming or that mode of gaming that sparks discussion and for folks that can't you know visual learners well they know that this is more chips than this and if they have a problem with that so i think that's what miniatures could bring to the hobby and there's some amazing games that do do that um even games that you would think would be not even in the ballpark of something historical, but there's something that miniatures brings out that I think can be used in our gaming. Great. We actually I just had a question pop up from, from Jim Snyder who asked, um, do you use any computer games or have computer support for wargame mechanics or use in, in wargame efforts? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I wish we did. We don't. Um, there are, so just to, in full faith and full fair advertising, the website I briefed you on, one of my writers is the uh, PR guy for Slytherin and they, they sell Command PE. And he asked me all the time, he's Italian, he goes, uh, como se, you know, why don't you use Command PE? And I'm like, because you're running, that game runs today with today's weapons, I need to be able to use it 25 years out. I need to be able to adjust the code on the fly. And that's a problem with using certain computer games. Because, because we use an open world with our teams, we don't know where they're gonna take the fight. And within a game that's structured, like a command series, and I play the hell out of all of their, uh, their commercial games, that I can't do anything the game won't let me do. So therefore I'm constrained to the dynamics of the game. Um, we try not to do that in our war games. So to find a game that we're able to do that with agility and with the same type of rigor, it, it moves too fast. And one of the things that the folks that I mentioned earlier that came up from uh, New Mexico said that they were gonna try to do was try to find a way to do that. So I wish there was. Um, and sometimes just classification. I can't put a TS system in Command P and model it. I, I can't because they own the code. And I can't give them, hey, can you put this in the game? Because they're, they're not clear. So I'm trying, <laughs> but right now, no, there isn't, uh, there isn't a way. Okay, great. I, I think, unless I missed something, I know the chat's been pretty active. Um, yeah, I need to check out the chat. It's, it's exhausting. Uh, it's exhausting, yeah. <laughs> I, How I, many times did they say that guy's an idiot? <laughs> and I know who did it, Phil Will Lamp. Excuse me, just kidding. Just kidding, Phil. Um, I, I think we're all set on questions. We'll maybe wait another minute in case you don't miss something, in which case, if I did, please just pop them down below uh, and, uh, or in case anyone's drafting them. So we'll wait a minute or two and then, um, yeah, if there's nothing else, then, then we'll, uh, we'll call yeah. it. Hey, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for uh, inviting me to speak. And um, all you guys that showed up today, guys and girls, thank you so much for this. Um, um, I will put my contact info out in chat. Look here, I got chat. Here we go. So uh, if you need to get in touch with me. And hopefully this is the right one. They just switched our email. But yeah, if you guys have any questions or if you want a copy of Truman, just send me an email. Um, but yeah, the questions were, uh, were awesome. And I'd like to thank you guys quite a bit uh, for not saying this guy's nuts, lock him up. I'm sure well, I'll get a big. 
Yeah, not yeah. saying it to your face. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, which is fine. Which is fine. Like I take enough abuse as it is. But uh, yeah, this was awesome. And um, if anybody has any questions in the future, please ask. Here we go.